When someone dies young, they tend to deify him and they tend to make it very easy. He was this great guy and he died young. It oversimplifies a very complicated life. And I actually think he was very textured, very detailed, not just as black and white. He's always been portrayed in two ways. Great football player. And he was such a prankster. I don't care who you are, how much money you got. We don't care. We're Chicago Bears. Bye-bye. And I almost consider that an insult to who he really was because he was so much more than that. You gonna be a football player when you grow up? be the finest quarterback produced for the last 10 years. And it's uh, none of the best decisions this organization has ever made. Right. That's all I need. Fortunately for me, I didn't lose my life. I didn't lose my job. Football convinced me that life is a team game. That's right. It's a game for me. There are more than a hundred golf courses in the greater Chicago area. But this one, Nickel No Golf Club, is the only one built on sacred ground. Nearly three decades ago, this was Walter Payton's place. And golfers on the ninth hole can still hear the echoes of his footsteps. Placed and people are out there hitting golf balls and having a good time, but I think it's more than that. It's that struggle, that challenge, and it's the way we approach it. And if we can approach it like my father did, we have a pretty good chance, I think, of being successful. And I always look at the hill as being like accomplishments. It's easy to be down at the bottom. Everybody can stay down there. And you can kind of get halfway up and you start feeling the fire burning a little bit. But it's nothing like when you get to the top of that hill and you can look down and say, man, I just made it all the way up here. All of Peyton's NFL records have been broken and he died in 1999. But his spirit endures. have a visual in my mind of him running that hill with the rules headband on and I said you know what if this works for Walter you know I'm gonna try it and I started doing hills when I built my house in San Diego I built a hill in the backyard and the whole point in it was to kind of put yourself through things that you've never been through before and I always told myself when, when I got tired and I wanted to quit, this is the time where you have to step up. What will Walter do? Walter wouldn't quit. This is like my hero growing up. I says the will to never stop. See, that ain't skill, that's heart. He gave me something that I once realized that I didn't have, and that's what I wasn't the biggest, I wasn't the fastest, I wasn't the strongest, but then I bumped into something called work ethic. Somebody gave me a photograph of the hill, and where it's just worn in, where he's like just run around and round and round and round and round. And growing up, I never really felt like I was great at anything. I felt like I was good at a lot of different things. And I felt like the only way I was ever going to be great at anything is hard work. And so he kind of became my 
idol or my inspiration for hard work and for what it took to be successful. Once you put wisdom with will on top of talent, you get what you call sweetness. How many people had the guts to wear like their nickname? I like roll around with your nickname. I like to call myself the difference. That's my nickname. And I'm just gonna get a headband of like the difference and wear it around. No way. I don't have the guts. But the sweetness is just as a simple nickname. It has like a different like, ten, you know, everybody's like the iron fist or the curtain, the ramrod or the head, you know, whatever. Like people give all these like nicknames that aren't like, Good, I mean, he was a sweetness. Besides being a cool nickname, sweetness was also a fitting description of Peyton's personality. He had a gentle spirit, honestly. He was easy to talk to. He sent you flowers and wonderful cards. He was quite romantic. We would go discoing all the time. He loved the dance. He was really good. As a matter of fact, he's known for dancing on Soul Train. It's funny because I was looking at my future husband, did not know I was looking at my future husband, you know, at that context. Peyton had the moves on the dance floor and the gridiron. Despite playing at Tiny Jackson State, the Chicago Bears selected him with the fourth pick in the 1975 draft, with the hope he could resurrect a struggling franchise. He's dreadful, uh, too weak a word. I mean, they were dreadful. Buckus was gone, Sayers was gone. There was a complete team breakdown. Coming to Chicago from Jackson, Mississippi, it's like, you know, another world. When he first came up, he was, you know, kind of a guy that walked around and didn't talk to too many people. His girlfriend, his college girlfriend, Connie, who would later marry, is at Jackson State. He's very lonely. His mother comes to live with him, so he's living with his mother in an apartment, and he hates it. Peyton also had trouble adapting on the field. In his first game, he carried the ball eight times and didn't gain a single yard. There were questions about whether he could play at, at that level from Jackson State. After the game, I was walking with my wife, and Walter was walking alongside us. And I could see he had tears on his cheeks. And my wife took his arm and said, you'll have better days. Chicago's two biggest sports icons are Michael Jordan and Walter Payton. Payton doesn't have a statue to commemorate his greatness. He doesn't need one. Sweetness lives on in the hearts of fans. Michael Jordan changed the game. Walter Payton didn't change the game. He just played it better than everybody else. Let's just go through Walter's stats. 77, 1,852 yards. That's insane. In his third year, Peyton won the NFL's Most Valuable Player Award. But it was the day he ran for 275 yards against the Vikings that made him a legend. The day that he uh, broke the single game rushing record, before the game, he was laying on the floor in the locker room, covered up with towels, shivering and shaking. He had the flu. It was a good story because I used to all my players all the time when they weren't feeling good. I just tell them that Walsh just had the single game rushing record with 104 temperature. And so you need to go get dressed. He won a game 7 nothing in Buffalo. He jumped over the line of scrimmage right at the goal line. And I, I said, the Bears are no longer a one-man team, they're one Superman team.
I do think he's the most complete back that I've ever seen. Taught himself how to be a really good receiver. He wasn't when he came into the league, but he got better at it. He was the best blocking back. I can say that unequivocally that I've ever seen. I can still see the game up in Minnesota that we're losing, and McMahon calls an audible. And as he's going to throw the ball, there's a linebacker coming ready to kill him. And all of a sudden, Walter steps up and levels the guy. He wanted to contribute in every way he could. Heck, he wanted to kick. We wouldn't let him kick. He thought he was a great kicker. Payton did attempt one punt in his career. It traveled 39 yards. Payton was far more effective returning kicks. As a rookie, he led the league in yards per kickoff return. The guy could throw a football, you know, probably 60 yards easy. There's a game, Walter Payton came in to play quarterback for the Bears. Not like as some joke, not as some gimmick. The guy could do everything. Even though he only weighed 205, 210 pounds, he ran as though he weighed 350 pounds. Walter believes he gained over a thousand extra yards over the course of his career by choosing not to step out of bounds. My style is one that I got from my college coach at Jackson State, Coach Hill. And he always thought, never die easy, he said die hard. I fell in love with one clip. Um, it was a run that he had against the Kansas City Chiefs. And ever since then, that's my guy. Despite his physical style, Peyton only missed one game in his 13-year career. Walter Peyton was a true warrior. Give me the heart of Walter Payton. There's never been a greater heart. Why he was good at what he did was all a product of what his uh, physical conditioning was, his mental conditioning, everything he put into the game. He expected the best of himself all the time. By 1984, Payton's relentless pursuit of excellence had him closing in on Jim Brown's career rushing record. He wanted to be the best player in NFL history. And breaking Jim Brown's record, that was the standard. That record, beating Jim Brown's record, meant everything to him. Every once in a while, my son asked me, what game am I going to break it in? <laughs> but <laughs> What do you tell him? I told him, wait till the press conference on Wednesday. <laughs> Walter failed to gain a single yard in his first professional game. Over the next nine years, he had gained over 12,000. Now, he stood only a few yards away from football's most coveted record. Second play of the second half of the 21 yard line. Walter needs two to break the record. Wide to the left is golf. McKinnon lines up wing to the right, high formation. Quick pitch to Walter, looking for the record. Cuts back. Jim Brown at the time was the standard, and Walter came in and took that standard to a whole nother height. And he did it in a way that was so classy and respectable. He wanted the attention, and deservedly so, and rightfully so. And it's a big deal breaking that record. But he didn't want it to look like he wanted the attention. And there's a great moment after the game when Ronald, or Ronald Reagan, who was the president at the time, was flying. They called him from Air Force One. Mr. Payton, this is Air Force One. Stand by for the president, please. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Very intense, please. Congratulations, 
Well, thank you, and give my best to Nancy. <laughs> he's just a wise ass. You know, he was just, that was sort of Walter Payton. I called him up and congratulated him. We had a wonderful conversation. Walter Payton was the epitome of greatness. I have all the admiration in the world for him. Payton was finally king of the hill. But there was still one summit left to reach. You're Walter Payton, and you've given your blood and sweat for the Chicago Bears. You're the best running back in the history of the NFL. And all of a sudden, you start having success. Fire the right side. And you have the fat rookie defensive lineman who's cute because he takes some handoffs getting the attention. The legend <laughs> continues, William Perry. They have the QB just because he has a mohawk and some sunglasses getting the attention. And there was definitely a part of Hayden that was like, you know, really? It was not easy when you're an icon and you're a marquee player and you're being overshadowed all of a sudden with the success. A citywide epidemic from church services to the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. He wasn't about making headlines, but then the whole league was changing. It was a whole kind of freedom and sense that were more about the individual. Walter, as great as he was, as huge a part of that team, the biggest part of that team, he sort of became just one of the guys From the outside, it seemed as though Walter Payton got lost in the shuffle. But he was still at the center of the 85 Bears. He was the leader. We had other leaders, but he was the leader. He was the practical joker. He's the guy that kept everybody loose. A team that was a little crazy around the edges could have easily kind of lost its focus and lost its way. And I, I, I think Payton, with the way he played, the respect he commanded in that room, and his quest to win a world championship kept the whole thing together. At age 31, Peyton led the Bears to a 15 and one record and a trip to their first Super Bowl. Peyton, the most successful rusher in the history of the National Football League, the Bears' all-time leading receiver, all-time leading scorer, Sweetness gets his chance today in the Super Bowl. And first offensive series of the game, Walter Payton fumbles. Peyton drill, fumbles the ball, and who is it? The New England Patriots! Tony Franklin kicks a field goal, 3-0 New England. Peyton is devastated. It was the fumble that set the tone for his game. I don't even think he had 10 carries in the first half. The game went away from him completely. He failed the team in the most uh, preeminent moment. Super Bowl XX was not a showcase for the game's greatest runner, but its greatest defense. This defense has been incredible. <laughs> To knock your socks off just to watch it. Total decimation to the AFC champion New England Patriots. The snap to Krug and the blitz is on. Over the left side, he goes. And they're ready! The Bears knew basically if they put the defense on the field, New England was never going to score. So you didn't need Walter Payton to rush for 150 yards. Everyone in red knew was going to get the ball. If you go back and look at some of those plays, he's running out this way, and half the New England defense is going with him. So sure, you hand the ball to Sue, or you make a pass over here to Gall. Oh, rainbows it deep down the right side. Willie it goes out here. It seemed like everybody on the Bears team was scoring touchdowns. I think the fans, even the Patriot fans, would want Peyton to have a touchdown. Well, you know, it is what it is. People can say, well, this is, no. 
it was a good game plan. I'd stick by the game plan. We won the football game. We did the right things. In the Super Bowl, Payton had 22 carries. Five times he was given the ball inside the Patriots' 10-yard line. And I wonder who's going to get the call on this one-yard line. Walter Payton doesn't have one. They're sending in Perry. First and goal from the one-yard line. Hand off to the Perry. I guess they figure they got a whole quarter to go. I remember that play live distinctly in my seven-year-old mind, going like, and it was pretty awesome that it was the fridge scoring, but we were all there sort of still thinking to ourselves like, well, Walter's going to get a touchdown. Walter's, Walter's going to get a touchdown. When they chose to give the ball to Perry, it was obvious that it bothered Peyton a lot. And when the game was over, he was peevish. The Chicago Bears are world champions of football. He was visibly upset, and it was obviously a great concern to me when I saw that after the game because I knew the media wanted to talk to him. And he was uh, hallowed up in a small little equipment room with just the shell of his uniform on um, and he was sweating he had tears in his eyes and had an angry look about him. I was in the locker room and Kenny Valdeseri came up to me and said we got a problem. He said Walter's in the back room and he says he's not going on television. So the two of us went back and we talked to him. He, he was livid. His eyes were just like a warrior's and he said I know damn monkey on a string gonna jump up for you. His agent, Bud Holmes, comes into the room and says basically, if you stay in here, or if you go out there and blast Dicka for not scoring a touchdown, you will be remembered for doing this for the rest of your life. You, after winning a Super Bowl, with a selfish SOB who sat in his broom closet and moped and ripped your coach. He thought about it for a while and eventually came out and he, he said all the right stuff, but he was, he was hurt. He was hurt badly. Can you describe the feeling for you personally? Right now, it really hasn't sunk in. I, I don't feel anything. It's, uh, it's one of those things where when you have it in your mind for so long, what it would be like, and then after the actual event happens, you know, it tends to take away from it. That cut him deep because he was Walter Payton. I mean, Walter had a huge ego, but not in a bad way. He, he had the right to have that ego, and he felt he had the right to score that touchdown, and it was taken away from him by one of his biggest supporters and his coach. Every time I see Mike Ditka, he always has to tell me that he's sorry. Yeah, sometimes you, you think about it and you say, eh. You know, maybe Mike forgot with all that was going on, but then it's like, how do you forget, like, one of the greatest players to ever play the game, that he's sitting on the sidelines and that he hasn't scored yet. Well, why didn't you give the ball to Walter on the goal line? You know, I said, I don't know. I really don't know. I didn't think about it. I didn't think it was important. Uh, when the game was over, I looked at the scoreboard and I saw the score, 46-10, and I knew we'd won. And I really, my mind, I, I can honestly say I was probably too focused in that game that I didn't think about the, the proper thing. I feel real bad for 34. It was taking him 11 years to, to get to this spot and to, not, and to not score a touchdown. I know Walter's not feeling good right now. and. Uh, you know, I don't feel that well for him. You know, it's, it's, I think he should have been carrying the football, but, you know, that's not my decision. And if I had to do over now, knowing what I know now, of course, I would do it differently. But I didn't realize it meant that much to him. And after finding out that it did, yeah, I would say it was my biggest regret, yes. Coming up. Piccolo and Sayers, that story was a little bit hyped. I thought that this was an even better story.
In the 1980s, there were few professional athletes as popular as Walter Payton. Two celebrities will take to the course today, Top Gun Tom Cruise and the NFL's all-time Top Gun Walter Payton. He had numerous endorsement deals and was the first NFL player to appear on the front of a Wheaties box. Payton enjoyed the fame and his sweetness persona was a perfect fit for a Hollywood lifestyle. Paul Zimmerman said it best. He said, when you were around Walter, you felt electricity, like sparks were flying off of him. When you were in his presence, you felt you were in front of royalty. Hello, Walter. Walter, how are you? Nice to meet you, man. Pleasure's all mine. Ah, my Who's that? This is my son, Simon. Hi, Simon, how are you? Yeah. Can you sign his bowl for him? He played too. He did have that Michael Jackson superstar aura about him, and then he would break through that and be this regular guy. He'd get right in your face and ask you your name and about you and your kids, and he wasn't some standard line. I mean, he was genuine. Peyton learned humility and respect while growing up in Columbia, Mississippi, despite being subjected to racism and segregation. He was colorblind, amazingly so. Columbia School District finally desegregated in Walter Payton's junior year of high school. They keep the white coats and they bring the teams together. It's very awkward. And the guy who starts cracking jokes and being like, ah, blah, 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 it's all Walter Payton. Walter Payton was one of the key guys when it came to breaking down barriers. I remember when his father died and that was a situation if you were ever going to uh, change your opinion about your fellow man, that would have been it. His father was, um, was arrested, was arrested for drunk driving even though he, he wasn't drunk. He had an aneurysm that caused him to appear drunk. They took him to a jail and he died in the jail cell. And it was a white sheriff's deputy and a white sheriff who took him there. And, and there were all these people who wanted to say, if this had been a white man, would they have done it that way? Walter, he didn't play the race card. And there were civil rights leaders who, who wanted him and, and expected him to. I know it was very painful for him. Um, it's one of the things that he really didn't talk about a whole lot. For the rest of his life, he never called Columbia his home. Whenever pe people would ask, he would say it was Jackson, not Columbia. Peyton seemed to get along with everyone, but only let a select few get close to him. His best friend was fullback Matt Suey. They were two guys from odd sides of the planet, but they just felt like they were connected some way. My youngest son, Scotty, was born uh, on 3 4 94, uh, 10 34 in the morning. And I called him up, told him the story. I'm his godfather. It's the first things out of his mouth. And uh, I said, oh, absolutely. I was going to ask him anyhow. It was kind of a big treat for my son. And I was kind of a thrill for him, too. Peyton and Suey's friendship was reminiscent of the one shared by former Bear backfield mates, Brian Piccolo and Gail Sayers. However, Walter and Matt's story was never made into a movie. Piccolo and Sayers, I thought that that story was a little bit hyped. I don't think their friendship ever reached the extent that uh, Suey and Peyton's did. And I uh, thought that this was an even better story. I felt like my dad and him really got close because they had to be on the same page. Matt being the fullback, my dad being the running back. You'd see those two on the field sometimes and, you know, wow, symbiotic. Matt watched my dad's back, kind of like being a bodyguard or protector. He blocked for him. He took a lot of hits and making sure that my dad would get the glory. And Matt kind of just sat back in the background, very unselfish. There's that picture of my dad pulling down Matt Suey's uh, shorts. It just symbolizes their friendship. Like, I'm back here. I'm going to joke with you a little bit, but you make sure I'm OK up there. I think that was his Christmas card in the early 90s you know, taking a peek into next year, which was not a great peek. But, you know, that's typical Walter. 
Matt was a person who he could always depend on. And I think that really showed, you know, especially when he got sick. And the fact that Matt was asked to be the executive estate of his estate, I think, says everything. He basically entrusted in him us. That's a huge thing. That's a huge responsibility for someone to take. And Matt did it graciously and without question. And I think we're all so thankful that he's been here for us. Even before he grew ill, Peyton always made sure that his kids were raised right. There's a game when I was in high school that we played against Holy Cross. And uh, play broke up, and I ended up taking it 60 yards. And I flipped the ball behind me and started slamming on my chest. I heard that whistle. He's on top of the press box. None of that. Jared didn't understand, and he would be mad about a lot of those things. But like he says, now I see and I can appreciate all those things Dad had me do because it's truly shaped me into who I am now. When you look at a friendship, there's rocky points in there. You get mad at each other and then make up. My dad was truly my best friend. Not only is my dad an exceptional athlete, he's a role model. He's my biggest role model and best friend. We made a wager who would be the first one to break down in tears. And after hearing my son get up here and talk, I don't care if I lose the bet. Up next, he was losing weight. You're like, well, what are you doing? It was so noticeable that people were starting to talk about it. In 1987, Walter Payton retired as a player to pursue his dream of becoming the NFL's first minority owner. But before his final exit, Sweetness wanted to leave the game with an enduring image. He set it up. He went off and sat by himself and kind of staged that look. Here was his last moment that he would be seen in a uniform. And I think that there was some degree of wanting to do that by himself. He wanted to be cast as being reflective about what he had just accomplished in a great career. Like he did as a player, Peyton committed himself fully to becoming an owner, hoping to prove he was more than just a figurehead. That makes it official, folks. <laughs> I'm black and I'm, and I'm proud of it. I'm here because I have something to offer, not because I'm black. When I look at people, I don't look at colors. I look at people that I can work with, and that's why I like for people to look at me. The whole thing falls apart, just falls apart. Not his fault at all. The uh, egos within the ownership group, money issues, and they gave uh, the first franchise to Carolina, and they gave the second franchise to Jacksonville. And Jacksonville, one of their owners was Deron Cherry, African-American former NFL player. I think that broke his heart. I really, really, really do. Faced with the harsh reality of a life without football, Peyton became depressed. He immersed himself in his favorite hobbies as he tried to figure out the next phase of his life. I know he went up and got a couple of caribou out in the, in the Arctic. This was nice. This was, hey, it's the biggest thing I ever had. He got into racing cars and all of these crazy things, I think, just trying to fill that void. Personally, I don't know if it was ever filled. The last 10 years of his life was a very, very sort of sad time for him. And I think he never found who he was. Filling the void football left wasn't Peyton's only struggle. He and his wife were drifting apart. Was he a good husband? By conventional standards, certainly not. He provided for his family, but he wasn't very faithful. When I heard talks of relationships up and went, well, no, I wasn't surprised. I mean, no, I, I mean, it wasn't, you know, yeah, hurtful. I thought it was just being not sure about the next phase of his life and what to do. 
the challenge in their marriage was football meant that he stayed here in Chicago a lot. But once that ended, there were so many other things out there that he was trying and he was gone a lot. She, in some ways, became a single parent. We had this really good day. And after he left the house and called back and he goes, there's something on, on, the, on your desk for you. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, of course it had been such a, be a good day. You could have knocked me over, I mean, and then my heart just kind of fell to the floor when I walked in and it was divorce papers. And I just thought it was one of those things where, you know, eventually, you know, he would figure it out and he would be back home. For the last 10 years of his life, they didn't really live together. He would come and go from the house. I don't think being Connie Payton was a very specifically easy thing to be. Payton wasn't perfect. And he was also, contrary to public perception, not indestructible. The toughest runner the NFL had ever seen had a rare liver disease. In 1998, he was losing weight. I probably would have paid more attention, but he wasn't around for me to really notice. But when we would do things with the kids, we were at sporting events, you're like, well, what are you doing? When he broke the news to me, and of course, it was very hard, and I started crying, but like he said, you know what? I'm gonna tackle this like I do everything else. I'm gonna give it all I got. He didn't want to announce that he was sick. He didn't want it to come out, but he was losing weight and losing weight and losing weight, and he had very jaundiced eyes. And Jarrett, his son, was announcing where he was going to college. They held a press conference at the high school where Jarrett went. He's, uh, he could play whatever he wanted to play. He, wanted, he could play running back or... Uh, it was so noticeable that people were starting to talk about it and whisper about it. And our reporter on the scene said, yeah, I talked to Walter. He said he overtrained for the marathon. And so I said on the air, he looks like Gandhi. I bet I could take him. Walter also had no control over media rumors about possible HIV, hepatitis, alcohol, or drug problems. The big rumor was that he had AIDS. It was all over the place. Walter Bain has AIDS. Look at him. He has AIDS. He was gay, and that he had AIDS. It got to the point where some people were saying some pretty negative remarks about it, and um, I think that's when, as, as a family, and he said, you know, we're going to have to come out with this. Walter has a rare liver disease, and it's called primary sclerosing cholangitis, uh, or it's known as PSC. Uh, the cause of the disease is unknown. Are you scared over this? Is Am I scared? Hell yeah, I'm scared. Would you be scared? But uh, what can you do? As a fan, you see those athletes as gods in a way, right? I remember when that happened, I went, oh, wow. I was like, my hero is a human being. And that's a really weird thing. He's Superman, you know. I just felt like he was going to be OK. He was going to pull through this. And I probably prayed for him more than anybody because I just, I love the guy, not even met him before, but he was so inspirational. He's probably one of the toughest human beings I've been around, to the ability to take physical pain. And it was tough. I don't say that lightly either. It certainly brought him down. To the people that really care about me, To the, to the people that really care about me, just continue to pray. And for those who are going to say what they want to say, may God be with you also. It was in May of 1999 when he was getting sicker, and we knew there had to be something more. It was discovered that Walter had bile duct cancer. And then he came home and we took care of him and I was happy to take care of him. And I still loved him and, you know, the kid's father and they loved him and, and uh, we were going to be, a, as Jared said, a team. And if he ever needed a team, he needed a team then. And I think he had a good team in all of us. I try to get out there, you know, at least three, four times a week. And when I would drive by, I'd look up and he would give me the 
the finger, you know, the, the one finger salute. And uh, uh, I think it was just to kind of say, hey, thanks. You know, I'll see you tomorrow, we'll see you, you know, whenever. When my dad got sick, he was always there for him. And, you know, my dad always needed somebody to lean on. So who better to lean on than your fullback who watched out for you most of your career? About a month before he died, and Walter put his arm around Matt and thanked him for being such a good friend. And he says, Matt, this is going to be another Brian song. The only difference is the brother dies in this movie. For 13 years, Walter Payton was football's Superman. But in the end, he wasn't made of steel, but flesh and blood. I can remember standing over the hospital bed that one day in our bedroom and looking at him. And, and something just hit me, you know, that he's really tired of the struggle. And I realized then that he needed to hear from me that it was okay. It was okay to go. I knew then that he was staying because he knew that we didn't want him to go. And then I realized how selfish it was to not let him know that it was okay. And that's what I told him that morning before he died, that it was okay, that everything was fine, that he, he everything was in order, and that um, if he was ready, that it was okay to go. And that was the first time in months that he opened his eyes and he looked at me and I knew then that I had said the right thing to him and I think that next morning he passed so you know tough. I mean, he really, <clears throat> good to break. There was a memorial service at Soldier Field and, you know, the whole thing just was kind of surreal. I got a little girl, she's four years old. Ten years from now, when she asked me about the Chicago Bears, I'll tell her about a championship, and I'll tell her about great teams, and great teammates and great coaches, and how great it was to be a part of it. But the first thing I tell her about is Walter Payton. Ever since my dad passed away, the number 34 appears everywhere. If I look at the clock, it's 2.34. It's I'm um, in a cab and I'm driving and I look and it's 2.347. It could be riding in somebody's license plate, it's like a 34. You get a ticket in the store, honestly, the 34. We were in a car accident and it threw us like 50 feet into a field. and. What do you know? Like the time on the clock was something 34. And honestly, I mean, the car accident could have been so much worse than it was. But we were, and not only that, but we were on Route 34 when it happened. It was kind of like he was there. He was watching over us, making sure that everyone was okay. It was freaking me out for a while, but it's actually pretty cool to know that he's just still around with me and that he's every, he's going to be with me every single day. On your mark, ready? Go! Good luck, everybody! Good luck! Woo! The Payton family is constantly reminded of the number and the man who wore it. 
moved out to California like 35 years ago, but I can't leave him Thank you. here. I appreciate He's a real hero. I met your dad after the 84 NFC Championship game in San Francisco. Ooh, yeah. He was a great man. Was, Thank you. He was a really nice guy. Thank you. <laughs> Nearly a quarter century has passed since the man called Sweetness retired. Yet he has left an indelible mark on the game, its fans, and a generation of runners who had yet to be born when he played. And he's been my favorite player ever since I was about eight years old. And that's just my guy. You know, I mean, I'm just so intrigued by him. I was just thinking of a nickname that I wanted to be known by. I thought a little sweetness. I went to the tattoo shop and the guy did it for me. The significance for me is that, you know, I'm his little protege. Uh, I got a little sweetness, 34, and I got rest in peace, Walter Payton. And I got a W and the Superman logo. It hurts that I never get to meet him, but I feel like if he knows how much I admire him, he'll be with me. There's never going to be anybody that can pay the wall to pay him. Emmett Smith has eclipsed Walter Payton as the NFL's all-time rushing leader. And somewhere, sweetness is smiling. Without Payton doing what he had done in the National Football League and representing all that he represents, he wouldn't have gave a young man like myself a dream or something to shoot after, and not only that, but something to marvel after, and a person to look up to and try to emulate in every way possible. One of my best friends, we just got into a massive argument over who the greatest running back of all time was. For me, it's Walter Payton. Like, defiantly, undoubtedly, without a question, it's Walter Payton. And he was like, no, 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 Emmett Smith is the greatest running back of all time. I'm like, Emmett Smith? So this argument's been going on for 10 years. So we're at Super Bowl last year in Dallas. And we happen to be in Jerry Jones's box. And who's there? Emmett Smith. So I go to Emmett Smith with my buddy. I'm like, all right, here it is. This is we're, 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 here, here we go. I say, Emmett, I say, who was the greatest running back of all time? And Emmett looks at me and he's like, Walter Payton. And that was it. That's like, that was it. Argument's over, Walter Payton. His name is at the top of the list. Trust me. Trust me, his name is at the top of the list. Walter Payton's rise to the top didn't come without struggles. And it was his ability to persevere that allowed him to ascend to the game's greatest heights. When I'm through playing football, I want to be known as a player that whenever he was out there on the field, every play, he gave everything that he had. And when he left the field, he left everything that he had in him on the field. What people will remember about Peyton, what a generation of players coming up used as inspiration from Peyton, um, was just the honesty of his effort. The way he attacked the game, what he demanded from himself, the way he prepared for the game, what he was willing to sacrifice and give in the pursuit of winning. I think that's kind of his coat of arms. When you look at what an athlete is supposed to be, that was him. He believed his duty was to play football. That was what he was put on this earth for. I believe in my heart that when God made a football player, he made my father. <laughs> 